Okay, we are looking, Revelation chapter 13, we are looking at the false prophet tonight. We've uh, uh, looked at, so far, Revelation chapter 13, we looked at the Antichrist. Tonight's the false prophet. Next Sunday is on technology and the mark of the beast. And let me tell you, we are way, way, way down that path on the technology of the mark of the beast. So that's going to be next time, and it is rather exciting And I'm going to tell you this also, it's also rather alarming. But that's next time. Right now, it's the false prophet. So let's consider some things. We have uh, Abbott and Costello, right? Got the dynamic duo. We have uh, the dynamic duo of Laurel and Hardy. Uh, We have the dynamic duo, Batman and Robin. Remember them, Dave? Indeed. We have Simon and Garfunkel. How about that dynamic too? How many of you are old enough to remember them? Boy, you guys are an old crowd. (laughs) Look at how young they are in that picture. That's great. Uh, And then, of course, probably the most famous dynamic duo of all time. You ready? Skipper and Gilligan, yeah? (laughs) Now... Become in pairs. But as it is, just in a little bit of fun in the comedy world, the music world, wherever it is, um, every ruthless dictator has a sidekick. Uh, Adolf Hitler had Joseph Goebbels, and he served in the role of spokesman for Hitler, becoming his minister of propaganda in 1933 when the Nazis came into power. He was a brilliant orator and one of the original spin doctors, and he masterfully shaped public opinion. He made sure of winning Hitler's popularity, and he only allowed one vision of the future to reach the masses, and that was Hitler's vision. But as masterful as Joseph Goebbels was uh, in shaping public opinion and, and being the propaganda minister that he was, he will pale in comparison to the one who the Bible describes as the false prophet. Uh, The number two man of the dynamic duo with the Antichrist. As it was with Joseph Goebbels, he will come on the scene serving with a singular purpose to subject the world to the vision of the Antichrist. Uh, What the false prophet will do He will do it by enforcing a global economy that requires all men to worship the Antichrist and receive the mark of the beast. If you don't receive the mark of the beast, if you don't worship the Antichrist, then you will be eliminated with the threat of death. He will also, with the Antichrist, involve himself in politics because he's going to have to involve himself with politics in order to ensure that the world is going to live as one, or at least that's the intention to live as one. He and the the Antichrist will never reach their ultimate goal, but they'll try. This vision of a global community will never be realized unless also the world is uh, unified through a religious uh, system. Hence, we have the term, the false prophet, and the final world religion. So with that... As I mentioned, we've seen the Antichrist. We're going to see the mark of the beast and technology next time. But Revelation chapter 13, beginning of verse 11, the Apostle John writes this. You ready? He writes, Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke like a dragon. So he says here, I saw another beast. Uh, What he's referring to by another Uh, In in chapter 13, verse 1, he saw the first beast who rises up out of the sea. That first beast was the Antichrist. This is another beast. Coming up out of the earth, he had two horns like a lamb, spoke like a dragon, and he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both 
speak and cause as many to, uh, who would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. He causes both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So let's stop here and let's start putting some of these things together. So how close are we to a religious system and a leader like the false prophet that we just read about? I believe that we are a lot closer than uh, most people think. Uh, The term for false prophet is not found here in Revelation chapter 13, but this term relating to this beast that we just read about is referred to in Revelation 16, Revelation 19, and Revelation chapter 20. And we notice a a few things about this false prophet. Um, From verse 11, we notice that he has lamb's horns, so he's very Christian in appearance. We're going to get to that in just a few minutes. We also notice that he has evil words. It tells us here at the end of verse 11 that he spoke like a dragon. We also know from what we just read that he is going to use religion as the, the tool to unify the world to the vision of the Antichrist. How do we know that? Because it requires all, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on the right hand or forehead and that they must worship the image of the beast. So this, this involves worship of this vision. It's a religious system. He appears Christian. But if you can understand the words he's actually saying, not the deceitful words that are going to trick so many people, we'll get to that. He's going to seem, he's going to appear to be very Christian. Now let me uh, bring into this prophetic scene uh, someone that I think... Um, you, you will be able to understand why I'm bringing him in here in a second. But I want you to know ahead of time, you come from a Catholic background, I come from a Catholic background. I'm not doing this because I have something against this person or against the Catholic Church. I'm just doing this because the current Pope happens to have, have a lot, give a lot of fodder uh, if you're looking for a teaching or an understanding on what the false prophet will be like. So we consider the current Pope and we start looking at certain things about him. Uh, In 2016, uh, this article came out in All Things Catholic, so this isn't a Protestant publication or secular publication, but All Things Catholic. In 2016, Francis may be a pope in search of a partner, someone that he can essentially run the world with. You start looking at this and you go, wow, well this is really really interesting. Uh, Here's this. Uh, This is out of Colombia, and this is uh, one Catholic leader who had a real problem with the Pope and still does apparently. Um, This is from 2017, about a year ago. Pope Francis, he said, was paving the way for the Antichrist. Uh, Then there's this. This is just real news, real recent. This is actually on my website. Um, Pope Francis, in Vatican interview with Eugenio Scalfari, calls for a federal Europe to be created as soon as possible. Um, Now, I I want you to consider this because the Bible is very clear that in the last days, there's going to be a uh, revived Roman Empire. Call it the United States of Europe. Uh, They've had the attempt at the European Union, a federal Europe, whatever it is you want to call it. And the Pope is going this direction. This article says, Europe must assume a federal structure as soon as possible. The resulting laws and political behaviors are decided by the federal government and the federal parliament not by an individual federated, uh, not by individual uh, confederated countries. Um, and then quoting the Pope, it's true. I've repeatedly uh, raised this. Uh, the Pope received many applauses and ovations. Continue to quote the Pope. Yes, that's right, but unfortunately it means very little. Countries will move if they realize a truth. Either Europe becomes a federal community or will no longer count anything in the world. So it's that mindset that we see with this current pope. And, and I'm, I'm not saying the pope is the false prophet. Um, but it's this mindset that you can see that the world is going there. You have the George Soroses, you have the pope. And, and so we're witnessing this. Uh, and Damon Duck uh, th- just wrote this. Uh, this just came out yesterday, I believe. Uh, um, 
He says, uh, according to the Bible, the false prophet will head up a global religion and conspire with ten political leaders. Uh, that'd be ten kings, Revelation chapter 17. Uh, to enrich themselves, persecute and kill those who become believers during that time. And he says this, a writer named Baxter Dimitri recently reported that a bishop that lives at the Vatican uh, named uh, Althanius uh, Schneider told a newspaper, uh, La Republica, in July of 2018, so sometime in the last 30 days, that the Vatican has been infiltrated with globalist leaders that are determined to eradicate Christianity in Europe and the West. According to Bishop Schneider, one of their key tactics involves flooding European countries with migrants in order to dilute the Christian base and radically change national culture and identity. The article said Pope Francis is one of those leaders. The, uh, Bishop Schneider suggested that the globalists at the Vatican are being paid by George Soros. Again, this is what's reported in there. Pope Francis and the religious globalists at the Vatican are conspiring with a new world political uh, with new world political leaders to establish an antichrist world religion. So I, I read that, and, and it's hard to tell you, you some of the things that I've read about uh, what the Pope said, including this article. Uh, some of the things that are coming out of Catholic Digest are saying he didn't really say that, and they say what he really said was this. But this has been going on for a number of years with Pope Francis, and he keeps meeting with Eugenio Scalfari, and the Catholic Church keeps saying, well, Eugenio Scalfari can't be trusted, but the Pope keeps going back to him, and they keep printing what Eugenio Scalfaro says. So you've got to kind of wonder what's going on there. Also, some of you, if you studied Bible prophecy 20, 25 years ago, uh, maybe you read a book by someone named Father Malachi Martin, uh, The Keys of This Blood. And in that book, I remember reading it, he, he, uh, he's, he's since dead, uh, but he went on to say that within, coming within the Vatican, so this goes back a few popes, uh, coming within the Vatican is just this, a globalist movement, and it's going to come, and it's going to, it's going to denounce the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and salvation through him is essentially what he said. So when I read these things, it's not shocking to me. It's not a surprise to me. But when, and when I, when I read this about the Pope, I, I, I got to go on the record saying, I'm not saying the Pope is the false prophet. But what this Pope does is he gives us um, an insight to the, to the direction of, of the political direction of the false prophet. And it's kind of like watching a movie trailer, right? You watch it before the, the it's the preview of coming attractions. And this, this Pope is, uh, is fantastic for things like that, just for the record. He just seems to give something, he's the gift that keeps on giving in this sense. I only have four questions I'm going to ask and four questions, things I'm going to answer tonight, all right? Usually I have like 10 or like 100 and keep you here till midnight. Not going to do that tonight. I'm hungry, I want a hamburger. Uh, first question, where does the false prophet come from? Um, Revelation chapter 13, verse 1, says that the first beast, the Antichrist, he came from the sea. Revelation chapter 13, verse 11 says, the second beast, the false prophet, he comes from the earth. That term earth is, comes from this Greek word gay, and it sometimes translates as Palestine. Uh, therefore, because it sometimes translates as Palestine, there are some who say that the false prophet must be a Jew because of the name Palestine, right? We already covered the name Palestine earlier. But the name Palestine, they say, must be a Jew. Um, I say not so fast. Uh, the word uh, as sometimes translates as Palestine. But the term earth or gay literally means country or globe. That's what it literally means. So some say, therefore... Uh, because it could be Palestine that he's Jew. Uh, some say, well, because it's Palestine, he's Muslim, right? So you start getting these things. Uh, if, if you were studying Bible prophecy when uh, Achmenejad was the president of Iran, Achmenejad said the Mahdi, the Muslim Messiah, was, he was uh, in a hole in the ground, in a well. Remember that? How many of you recall that? You'll see, you remember that? He said he's in a hole in the ground, in, in a well, a water well, waiting to come up out of the well and take over the world. Uh, crazy ideas, but because the false prophet comes out of the earth, uh, you, know, you look at this and you go, in, interesting things. Others say uh, the false prophet uh, 
is this particular pope that's the pope right now. Um, this pope helps us to understand the thinking of being a globalist. And when you look at the term earth, a country, or globe. But here's what doesn't matter. What doesn't matter is where the false prophet is from. What does matter is his character, his agenda, and the various things going on with the false prophet so we can understand um, the world in which we live in and understand why we see political things and religious things happening like they do. By the way, like the Antichrist, the false prophet is never referred to with a feminine title. It's all masculine. The Antichrist is all masculine. So he knows a he, not a she. Same thing with the false prophet. as a he, uh, not a she. Uh, so number two, uh, what will people think of the false prophet? Um, they will think he, will, he is marvelous. Simply marvelous. Think about this. Jesus said, in Matthew 24, verse 24, for false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. We just read in Revelation, uh, chapter 13, verse 13, that he performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Uh, so the masses are going to think he's marvelous. Jesus even refers to him being able to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Uh, and one of the most insightful things about the false prophet tells us in verse 11, again, mention this, that he has two horns like a lamb. So here's the deal. This is insightful because this man will appear to be the embodiment of of everything Jesus was and everything Jesus spoke about. At least he appears to be that way to people who do not study Bible prophecy. To people who do not study Bible prophecy, I believe it would be much easier to be deceived by someone like this. But when you understand what the Bible says about him in the last day's religion, a light can go on and go, aha, wait a minute, I've heard about this. He... And the Antichrist with him will be so deceptive, again, that Jesus said, if possible, even the elect would be deceived. But the two horns like a lamb, let us know that the, he's a religious leader who appears to be harmless, humble, holy, gentle, and you can go on down the list. Now consider this article uh, that appeared uh, some time ago, this was 2016, so a couple years back. Uh, Mocha's Midrash and Mystery. Pope Francis, another Moses. Now this is the viewpoint of this author who wrote this article, this Jewish author who wrote this article. Uh, Pope Francis, this is, quoting, this is a quote from the article, Pope Francis embodies these qualities which are those of all great authentic religious leaders. Drawing on an essay about Moses as the paradigm of the true religious leader by Archbishop Bruno Forte, I would like to notice three qualities of Moses that I find compelling in Pope Francis. His humility, encounter with the divine, and service to the people. So I, I look at that and, and I think in my mind, okay, that's a, a, a Jewish person, a secular Jewish person, when he looks at the Pope, and what's he see? I would say he sees two horns like a lamb. And he's like, wow, this guy's... Did I tell you that the Pope gives us a lot of fodder for something like this? I mean, you start looking, and he just does. It just, like I said, he's just the gift that keeps giving. Um, but think about this with me. If you take all of the Bible, if you take everything the Bible says about Jesus Christ, his miracles, his care for the downtrodden, if you think of the words of the Sermon on the Mount, the feeding of the masses of people when they are hungry, healing the sick and on down the list. If you take everything Jesus did and everything Jesus said, but you leave out the cross and the fact that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, what do you, what do you come away with? You come away with a different gospel. You come away with good works, but you do not come away with the truth. A gospel that sounds good because it will talk about healing the sick. We'll talk about health care, feeding the poor, treating others as you want to be treated, 
the golden rule, etc., etc., etc. It sounds like everything we hear that is promoted to us today that's told that we need to believe. So let's put it into the context of everything. Uh, According to Jesus himself, when that is what you have, you do not have the gospel of truth, but the gospel of deceit. Um, It's not the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's what we would call the uh, social gospel. Um, It's what I would say you could even call the uh, gospel of Judas. Let me show you this, right, Uh, from uh, John chapter 12. John chapter 12 is what the Bible says. Just hear these words out. You, You can think through this with me. Then, six days before the Passover, this is the Passover when Jesus is going to be betrayed and hung on a cross, right? Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus was who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. And they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Now, what was happening? Lazarus is the person that Jesus raised from the dead. Remember that? After he'd been dead, dead four days, and the Bible said he's so dead his body stinketh because he began to decompose. So he'd been raised from the dead. So what this is, six days before Passover, uh, it's a thank you dinner for Jesus. We want to thank you for what you've done. Okay? Martha and Mary were the sisters of Lazarus. They gave him this big thank you dinner. Then Mary, she took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with fragrance of the oil. Ah, expensive oil. A year's wage by some estimates. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, the one who would betray Jesus, said, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor, hence a year's wage. That was a lot of money. Uh, one uh, translation says in another one of the Gospels about the same event, Jesus said, what a waste. Right? What a waste. Uh, a year's wage wasted on Jesus. This Judas said, not that he cared for the poor, he appeared to care for the poor. He appeared to have lamb's horns. Right? He appeared to care for the poor. But because he was a thief, he said it, and he had the money box, and he used to take what was put in it. But Jesus said, let her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial. In other words, it was an act of worship. And then Jesus said, but the poor you have with you always. Uh, It was with Jesus, it's worship first and the good works follow. With Judas, it was don't worship Jesus at all. Uh, Just do the good works. Uh, It's the social gospel. It's uh, the gospel according to um, Judas. Appears to be good. It appears to be right. Uh, let, Let me ask. Have you noticed that all religions have a central theme um, of rejecting the Jesus of the Bible and rejecting the cross, but promoting good works. Those are the foundational things of all religions from what I've noticed when it comes to saying that you are right with God. Interesting, isn't it? Hence it will be with the religious system of the last days. We are already there. We are already being uh, well prepared uh, for it. It's, and by the way, it's coming like a freight train. Let me read just a, a couple of paragraphs to you. And this is from my book I came out with a, a couple of years ago. I haven't had it memorized, never committed it to memory. Uh, but from America in the New World Order, I, I talked about various things. Uh, one of them is this. In June of 2015, Pope Francis issued his encyclical on climate change. Uh, climate change, I believe, is one of the tools that the UN wants to use to subject the world to certain laws. But it called for uh, global entities to wrest control from local governments. This is a quote. International negotiations 
cannot make significant progress due to positions taken by countries which place their national interests above the global common good. In other words, you cannot have America first policy. Make sense? Because it's against the global common good. Hence, we have the globalists versus you know, the, the nationalist movement. The Europe is, is going through the exact same thing we're going through. Just not, it's just not as well known. Same thing. Pope Francis explained there's an urgent need of a true world political authority. Now listen to that. One authoritative source of oversight and coordination which lays down rules for admissible conduct in the light of the common good. One world authority. So you, you look at this and you go, wow, this thing is coming like a freight train. And the only thing that needs to happen is a rapture needs to take place to get us out of the way. Because the foundation's already laid. But uh, let me read this, this last uh, part to you and then we'll move on. Before Trump was president, the Trans-Pacific Partnership was a trade agreement and it was moving forward. Uh, Trump killed it, but I believe it's going to come back. It's going to resurrect maybe by the same name or maybe by a different name. But the Trans-Pacific Partnership has an entity called the Commission. Now that sounds frightening. The Commission of the TPP was meant to be powerful. It is, I'm convinced, it is going to resurrect. But listen to this. This was the intent. It's dead for now, but I believe only for now. The TPP Commission has the authority to protect, among other things, fish, seals, trees, and wetlands. That means it controls the water in the land. It has the authority to stop all kinds of land and water pollution. Sounds great until you realize that pollution is just a matter of your own definition. The Commission has the right to tell people where they can and cannot live and where they can and cannot work. Um, this is really, uh, what, what all that we see going on with all these different, the UN and climate control, Agenda 2030, the, the now dead TPP, uh, statements that the Pope makes, uh, the globalist agenda, it's about bringing all nations into subjection of the globalist uh, government. That is why we see things taking place as they are uh, in the world now. Um, question number three. What is the character of the false prophet? We can get a good idea by the text. Uh, verse 11 tells us he is another beast. The term another comes from the Greek word allos. It means different. Different, however, but of the same character. Beast uh, comes from this Greek word theron, and it simply means a dangerous animal. So another beast he's, is referring to the first beast, the Antichrist. So he's different, but he's of the same character as the Antichrist. Um, the false prophet has the same beast-like character and attitudes of the Antichrist in the system that the Antichrist rises out of. Uh, this teaches he's another, he's different, it teaches us that they are two different men, but they both have the same agenda. And the false prophet, as the propagandist for the Antichrist, is going to make sure that the vision of the Antichrist is the one that the world gets and the one that the world subjects itself to. But both the Antichrist and the false prophet, since it says another beast, they are both vicious monsters and work together against God and his people. Uh, second thing about his character, verse 11 also tells us he speaks like a dragon. Satan uh, in the Bible is referred to as uh, the dragon. Uh, here we learn the false prophet is going to speak like Satan himself. We also know that Satan is a deceiver. His fall from heaven was because of his great sin of pride. His main purpose is, is uh, his, uh, Satan's main purpose was to promote himself and lie about Jesus Christ. Uh, and the way it, this is all going to work out between the Antichrist and the false prophet is it is going to sound so good to the masses. Again, everything that's taking place, from the miracles that work to the words that are spoken, people are going to say, yes, I like that. Let's all just do a group hug. right? Let's just all get along. 
The only ones that are problems are those crazy Christian people who say, no good works you should do, but you really need to know Jesus. They bring the cross into everything. That's a problem. Those people are a problem because they get in the way of us all being able to live in unity under this globalist uh, movement. So it's going to sound good. The masses of the people will receive the Antichrist because they will believe the lie that's told to them. And I believe the lie that's told to them is going to be promoted to them by the false prophet. Second Thessalonians tells us uh, the coming of the lawless one that would be the Antichrist is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and line wonders. What did Revelation 13 tell us? That the false prophet has those powers and when he's in the presence of the Antichrist, the Antichrist is even able to do these things. Right, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish. Wow. Because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. In other words, they rejected the cross, right? The good works, the good works, the good works. Do not, you, don't you dare bring the cross into this conversation. Man. Wow. They did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. I look at everything that's going on. Some of the things I see going on, I have no other explanation except for God has already started the delusion. Because it doesn't even make any sense. I mean, where do we suddenly have not just two genders anymore? But we have three genders. Some, pla some places are saying, no, there's, there's 50 genders. And where do these things come from? You know, they, they, they don't make any sense. Um, people are confused. And there's a delusion. But God says, and you start looking across the board. Uh, Isaiah the prophet warned of the time coming when right would be called wrong and wrong would be called right. Uh, but, uh, but when you look at all this, the biggest lie of all is that Jesus is not the Messiah and the only hope uh, that is really out there is to follow the Antichrist and listen to the words of the false prophet. Because the Antichrist is the one with the answers. And the false prophet is going to appear to be very Christ-like. He, but he will speak like a dragon. Verse 11 told us he's going to speak like a dragon. He will lead a movement of a religion for people to follow. Now think on this. We're almost done. In addressing the September 1989 prayer gathering, so this goes back 29 years. So this has been building for a long time. Been building since the Garden of Eden, actually. Actually, Tower of Babel, you start tracing it really crazy. But in addressing the September 1989 prayer gathering of Christians, Muslims, Jews, Buddhists, and others, Pope John Paul II told participants that their efforts were unleashing profound spiritual energies in the world and bringing about a new climate of peace. The Pope pledged that the Catholic Church intends to share in and promote such ecumenical and interreligious cooperation. Simple enough, and, uh, simple enough, but check this out. The publication Catholic World commented on this and said, The unity of religion promoted by the Holy, uh, by the Holy Father Pope John Paul II and approved by His Holiness the Dalai Lama, is not a goal to be achieved immediately, but a day may come when the love and compassion, which both Buddha and Christ preach so eloquently, will unite the world in a common effort to save humanity from senseless destruction and leading toward the light in which we all believe. So the Catholic, um, this publication, a Catholic world attempted to say, well, the Pope really didn't mean this, and this is what he meant. And they, they, re, they, they actually solidified it even more when you, when, you, when you look at this. So you start putting all of these things together, and then now we come across something like this. This is fairly recent, March of 2018. You look at the Pope. This says Jerusalem at top of agenda as Turkish president to meet Pope. Why does the Pope care about Jerusalem? Why would any religious leaders, not Jew, care about Jerusalem? Because Jerusalem and the Jewish people are the apple of God's eye. And Satan knows this, that the Lord is going to come back and he's going to rule and reign from Jerusalem. And Satan also knows this, and this is why there's so much anti-Semitism in the world, that if he can eliminate the Jews from this planet, then the Lord doesn't have Jewish people to return to. Uh, the, but the Bible tells us differently. God had a covenant 
an unconditional covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And it was an unconditional covenant to them to be their God forever. It was a covenant that would be an everlasting covenant, a never-ending covenant. And he gave them the city of Jerusalem. And so you start looking at all of these things, and I know this, that between the po- uh, excuse me, between the false prophet, <laughs> between, the, between the false prophet and the Antichrist, Jerusalem is the epicenter. Uh, that's, the, that's, that's the deal of the century. Uh, Donald Trump keeps talking about the deal of the century. Uh, it would just be the, listen, the, the, the peace that's going to come to Jerusalem, the first peace that's going to come there is going to be a false peace. That's not going to be the deal of the century. That's going to be the deal of the, of the last 2,000 years is what it's going to be. But then the Lord is going to return because that is going to be a false peace. It's the, uh, it's the 70th week of Daniel. It's a term it's a, a, of seven years that's specific to the Jewish people. It's when God shakes up the world through the great tribulation and wakes up his people, the Jewish people. Last question, this one's real quick. What will be the false prophet's biggest accomplishment? This is real easy. If I can find it. Oh, wouldn't you know I had to turn my Bible. I'm not even in the book of Revelation anymore. Revelation 13. He causes all, verse 16, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Um, the false prophet, his greatest accomplishment will be cause the world to worship the Antichrist, to worship the devil. The false prophet is going to do a lot of talking about loving, accepting, diversity, gender equality, everybody getting along. I do not believe the false prophet is going to come on the scene when it comes to that place of the tribulation period and say all religions just need to get along, but it's going to be subject your religion to the greater common goal of the global religious system. Um, I'm not going to play the game of uh, naming who the false prophet is. I don't know. Or naming who the Antichrist is. I don't know. But the road is paved, the stage is set, we are fast-tracking to a final religious empire, and not long from now, the world is going to be introduced to that man, and also going to be introduced to uh, the Antichrist. But, Jesus himself said, man, when you see these things begin to take place, look up, for your redemption draws near. Amen? Amen. And everything's moving quickly.